Hello. Welcome to the archives. Uh, I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And today we go on an adventure. Uh, this is Archival Adventures. It is a weekly show that I do here uh, from the library, uh, from Newman Library on the campus at, of Virginia Tech. And um, we discover things in our archives at the same time. Um, and by discover, I don't mean that they were lost in the archives. Just that um, no one archivist here knows everything in the collection because there are just too many things. So most of the things that we look at on this show I've never seen before. Uh, and we get to find out about them together. Um, <clears throat> music is a little loud. OK. Uh, I will adjust that, probably because, <coughs> um, oh yeah, look at that. All right, uh, let me know if that music balance is better. Um, I used to, I, I previously used the desktop app for, the, for Pretzel Rocks, um, but last Thursday, my Mac operating system started telling me it was not compatible and it won't launch. So I'm playing from the browser today and forgot to adjust the volume. Uh, so, <clears throat> so yeah. Um, before we dive in on today's collection, um, I do want to go ahead and read the Land and Labor Acknowledgement. Um, that is the Virginia Tech official Land and Labor Acknowledgement that I uh, like to highlight at the start of every archives stream. <clears throat> Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudalo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudalo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Ut Prosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> and um, because of the date today, uh, before we move past um, <clears throat> the acknowledgement of the failure of institutions with regard to indigenous people and people of color, I do just want to note, uh, since this is a stream about history and um, paying attention to history, uh, two years ago today is the day that George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. Um, so, <clears throat> I just felt like uh, while I'm not focusing the stream on anything related to that today and, and the stream that I have today does not focus um, specifically on people of color, um, I did not want to let the day go unmarked. So um, let me... <coughs> drop that in that chat. <coughs> So what we do have for you today is a, um, a collection that serendipi serendipitously is about wine, specifically wine labels. And I, uh, I popped on social media this morning and discovered something that I did not know when I scheduled the stream today, which is that it is National Wine Day today. <laughs> so um, I just serendipitously picked a collection related to wine and scheduled it for National Wine Day. Uh, so couldn't be more appropriate. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, abs no, it, I, I'm sorry, um, let, me, let me rephrase. I 100% totally planned it. It was absolutely calculated and uh, I hope that you believe that. 
Um, let me actually say hello to the people in chat since I see you chatting. Uh, hi, Lord Portico. Hi, Key Squared. Hi, Thorkel. Um, hi, Fludan. Hi, Hannah. Uh, welcome in. Um, and for anybody who might be new here uh, and ha hanging out lurking, um, this stream goes out to two channels. It goes out to the Virginia Tech University Libraries channel as well as my personal channel on Twitch uh, because the more the merrier for an educational history stream. Um, <clears throat> I do want to actually read uh, a little bit about the finding aid and um, the person whose material, or the people whose materials we're going to look at today, uh, just give a little bit of a bio sketch of this person. Um, before we dive in and see the over 5,500 wine labels uh, that this collection contains. So, <clears throat> let's see. Isn't every day really wine day? Um, not for me. <clears throat> I'm gonna need your, I'm gonna need help on this one. Um, I think it sounds absolutely amazing and I, I appreciate old advertisements uh, but I know next to nothing about wine, uh, so I will definitely need assistance today. Um, all right, biographical note. This is directly from the finding aid, uh, which should be linked in the chat for you. Uh, Frank Leslie Campbell <clears throat> was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on September 5th, 1898. He attended Haverford College and the University of Pennsylvania receiving a degree in chemical engineering from the latter institution. Following graduation, Campbell worked as a chemist in the Japanese Beetle Laboratory in Riverton, New Jersey, then obtained master's and doctoral degrees in entomology, the study of bugs, uh, from Rutgers University and Harvard University, respectively. <clears throat> After completing his doctorate, Campbell taught at New York University for a year then was appointed to a research position in the United States Department of Agriculture's Bureau of Entomology, where he concentrated on the application of toxic substances in controlling insect pest populations. His research led to the development of the aerosol bomb used in the control of mosquitoes and other flying insects. From 1936 to 1942, Campbell served on the faculty of Ohio State University and also as a consultant for the Office of Agriculture War Relations, or Office of Agricultural War Relations. Uh, following World War II, Campbell served five years as editor of the Scientific Monthly, then 11 years as executive secretary of the Biology and Agriculture Division, National Academy of Science, National Research Council, <clears throat> and following retirement, he continued to conduct research at the University of Vienna, Austria, and in New South Wales, Australia. For four summers in the 1970s, he was a visiting professor of entomology at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Frank Campbell died in Washington, D.C. on July 13, 1979. And none of that is why there is a wine label collection here from him. We do not have anything related to his work as an entomologist, nothing related to his time on the National Academy of Science, National Research Council, nothing from his education at Harvard or Haverford College or the University of Pennsylvania. We have none of those things. What we do have is more than 5,500 wine bottle labels gathered by Frank Campbell <clears throat> and his wife, Ina. The labels have been affixed to index cards with each card bearing Campbell's commentary on date, place, and method of acquisition, as well as the quality of the wine. The collection also includes a typescript draft of the Campbell's 1964 to 1966 European travel memoir, Better Late, an entomologist's post-retirement renovation. So, I am unclear whether the wine labels were entirely gathered by him and his wife after his retirement, 
or whether they were gathered throughout his lifetime. I suppose we will discover as we look at the dates on the cards. But um, <clears throat> when I first pulled up the finding aid to, to find the collection for today, and I was reading, I, like I found it because it was tagged um, with a subject term. And that was, um, yeah, it was tagged with the subject term wine labels. And so I clicked on it for that. And the first thing I saw when I went into the collection was this biographical sketch about an entomologist. And I was like, I don't understand. This is a collection of wine labels. The subject term wine labels was this mis misapplied. Why is this here? Uh, this collection is from an entomologist. Is this not a collection about bugs? Uh, and then I read further and I saw 5,500 plus wine labels and I had to see it for myself, which is why it is now on a cart to my left and we're gonna look at it today. <clears throat> 5,500 labels is a lot, yeah. And if he had opinions on the wine quality, he must have at least sampled each bottle. Indeed, indeed, one wine bottle a day, uh, 5,500 would be 15 years of wine. So, wow. I don't know for sure if he uh, has commentary on every label. I really have not really looked. There was one folder in here that had some loose labels in it and I used those to make a collage that was used for the graphic uh, for this episode. Um, I think the place we're going to start is with a glance at the memoir uh, before we dive into the labels themselves because it's interesting. We won't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, it is pretty neat. and. Uh, if some of them came from tastings, could be significantly shorter. Indeed, that is true. Um, I, have, I have actually been to wine tastings and wine dinners before. Uh, I just, I don't really like wine, so I don't really drink much of it. Um, what I do like is old ads and wine labels are very much advertisements. So <clears throat> I'm excited by it. Uh, but. Yeah, we're going to start with this, this massive tome here. Uh, we are not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to glance at it, look at the construction. Um, it's got duct tape on it. Classic silver duct tape holds anything together. Uh, it has uh, the title put on with a label maker. Um, so we're definitely going to glance at this. Oh, and I do see that we are getting a raid from the always wonderful 16-bit Eric. Welcome in, uh, Eric and Raiders. It is lovely to see you today. Um, I hope that your time with Jurassic World was, was good over on the stream. I had to pop out, obviously, for this. Um, but welcome in. Good to see you, Key Squared. Uh, if anybody is not following 16-bit Eric, um, he regularly raids into this program, and I very, very much appreciate it. Uh, so um, if you're at all interested in anything tabletop role-playing game related, you should definitely give a follow. Um, he is one of, if not the best, game master on the internet. Um, and so if you happen to be watching our the Virginia Tech University Libraries channel, you know that we occasionally stream some role-playing content over there. You should definitely drop a follow over to 16-Bit uh, Eric. Um, but for everybody just joining us, we are looking at a collection today that is a collection of 5,500 plus wine labels collected by a, um, a very prominent, uh, very accomplished entomologist. Um, and yeah, 5,500 plus wine labels. And I picked this collection without knowing that today is National Wine Day. So uh, what better day to look at some wine labels? He apparently affixed them all to index cards and made notations on them about uh, the date and place 
where he got the labels as well as the quality of the wine. So um, if that sounds interesting to you, I hope that you'll stick around. We are starting with a uh, glance at the one non-wine label thing in the collection, which is a memoir by him and his wife. Uh, his name is Frank Leslie Campbell. His wife was I Ina Lee Campbell. Um, and <laughs> they seem to have a bit of a sense of humor just based on the title of this memoir. Uh, so. I'm going to switch this over so you can see what's on the table in front of me. <clears throat> uh, this is the, as far as I'm aware, only copy of Better Late by Frank Leslie Campbell and Ina Lee Campbell. Uh, it is bound using duct tape. It has the title affixed using uh, a label maker. Video did not switch, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I think you should be able to see it now. And that was, that was totally my mistake. I hit one button, but it's a two button press to, to switch scenes uh, in this setup. Um, but yeah, so you can see the duct tape, you can see the, um, the title made with a label maker. Um, and I, I just think it's worth glancing at this. This is, this is a quality memoir. This is, for, for all that it's put together with duct tape and the title was put on with a label maker, this is well done. It is solid, it has held together, it is quite nicely made. Um, the title page here, Better Late, Frank Leslie Campbell and Ina Lee Campbell. Uh, Gift to Virginia Tech Library by Mrs. F. L. Campbell. Uh, uh, forwarded through. I don't know for sure what that says, but um, apparently it was given to the library on February 4th, 1980. <clears throat> and this is a thing that shows up in archives a lot. If you ever dig through archives, if you ever look at archival materials, historic materials of any kind in um, Western European influenced cultures. So the cultures dominated by the British Empire, the uh, French royal influence, the Roman Empire, uh, things of that derivation. Um, you'll often see women show up in archives as Mrs. and then their husband's name. In this case, we happen to know that her name actually is Ina Lee Campbell. Uh, but in, in the inscription here, she is uh, Mrs. Frank Leslie Campbell. Uh, and oftentimes, the only documentation of a woman who made contributions to history and has documents in an archives will be as Mrs. Husband's name. And we will not even know the woman's actual name uh, because it's not documented anywhere. Uh, and I think that is not great but uh, I just wanted to point to that. Uh, we're not gonna spend a lot of time with the book. We're gonna get to the wine labels very quickly here. Uh, but Better Late, an Entomologist's Post-Retirement Renovation. Uh, what a cheerful piano. Um, yeah, this is just the Pretzel Rocks uh, Chill Jazz channel. So this is post-retirement, they went on <clears throat> they went on a tour of, it looks like, Europe and Pacifica, if I'm reading the locations properly here, because um, also possibly some of the, uh, wait, I'm not sure the location of Tahiti. Is Tahiti in, the, in Pacifica? My geography with, the with regard to the location of Tahiti is, uh, is, is lacking. Um, but it appears they went to London, Central Europe, it Italy, um, Austria, Central Europe again, 
Greece, Australia, Sydney, uh, Sydney and Canberra, and uh, looks like other places in New South Wales. Fiji, Western Samoa, American Samoa, and Tahiti, all um, in the Pacific. Thank you, Thorkel, for confirming that Tahiti was the Pacific. So this appears to be um, a lot of Europe, Australia, and some Pacific islands uh, were their travels. And so I would not be surprised if the majority of the wine labels come from those locations. Um, <clears throat> I doubt we're going to read the entire forward. Eh, it's not too long. Maybe we will. We'll see how engaging it is. In 1963, we had been associated with academic people for 16 years. We had worked for them, but did not enjoy all their privileges, such as the sabbatical year, often spent abroad. We were envious. It became clear that if we were to have a sabbatical, it would have to be declared by us, and it would have to take place after we retired. Retirement from employment on the staff of the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council was encouraged at age 65, but was not obligatory. I decided to stay on as executive secretary of the Division of Biology and Agriculture until 30 June 1964, into my 66th year. It was fitting for Ina to retire from government at the same time, we began to make our plans about a year in advance for our first sabbatical. <clears throat> we not only wanted to travel, we wanted to indulge other interests or hobbies. As a super saturated solution may be caused to crystallize out, so our plans were caused to congeal by an incident that occurred at the uh, 16th International Congress of Zoology in Washington in August 1963. Dr. Samuel Williams, a guest professor at the University of Vienna and a former entomologist, introduced me to Professor Dr. Wilhelm uh, Kunelt, head of the Second Zoological Institute of the University. His name took me back 38 years when I had been interested in, as a graduate student at Harvard in chitin, the principal component of the exoskeleton of insects. One of Kunelt's earliest papers was on the same subject, and I had cited it. I had had no, pay, no contact with him since and had never met him before. <clears throat> Here was a man who could make it possible for me to work at the University of Vienna on a piece of research that I had laid aside in 1928 as irrelevant to my duties. What fun it would be to take it up again as an amateur, entirely free to make what I could of it. I let Professor Kunelt know that I would like to work in his institute and in due time, I received an official invitation to occupy the guest laboratory for the academic year 1964 to 1965. Everything we did subsequently revolved around this great opportunity for me to return to personal research. It happened that an International Congress of Entomology was to be held in London early in July 1964. This determined the time of retirement, for it seemed sensible to begin our sabbatical with entomological refreshment. We would officially retire on 30 June and board the old Queen Elizabeth for Southampton the next day, not to return for at least a year. Meanwhile, we would rent our Washington apartment unfurnished. We visualized traveling on the continent to, in our own car during the summer and then enjoying nine months of entomological research and music in Vienna. Perhaps for economy, we would then declare a second sabbatical without coming home. Uh, this book evolved from a diary of our experiences from 1 July 1964 to 30 June 1966. We keep our family and close friends informed of our adventures. We condensed, or to keep our family and close friends informed of our adventures, we condensed the diary into 92 periodic letters. Subsequently, we converted the newsletters into a single manuscript. We shared its con composition through joint discussion and editing. <clears throat> Wherever appropriate, we have used the first person plural. But because FLC dictated the letters to Ina's typewriter, we found it natural to use I for him and Ina for her when reference to one or the other was necessary. Uh, we had two good reasons for preparing this book. One, we would enjoy reviewing the good times we had had. And two, Cousin George, who did not discover us until 1969, would enjoy reading it. Though my research on the antennae of cockroaches was most important to me, we did not stress it in our story. 
believing it to be unsuitable for the recipients of our newsletters. The results of my research were not ready for publication until we returned to Washington at the end of July 1966. The necessary illustrations might never have been completed had not my friend, friends in the Department of Entomology at Virginia Polytechnic Institute invited me to use their facilities to it to finish them. Two papers that were based upon my work in Vienna and Armadale were finally published. I cite them below. Um, and there's two papers listed. Uh, yeah, so that is a note from 1973. Um, we're missing out on a wealth of cockroach antenna knowledge. All right, computer, why are you going to sleep? Tell me, tell me why. Apologies, one second, I have to just um, yell at the power settings on my computer um, because it is connected to power, it is fully charged, and it should not be putting the display to sleep while I'm streaming. <clears throat> I think it's because I have, I have chat up instead of the, like I have it up in a separate window and it's taking the screen and so like the actual like monitor, the video that I would normally be able to see uh, is not on the screen, and because the video is not actively playing on the screen, I, I don't know. That's my supposition. Um, I'm just going to randomly pick a page, and we're just going to look at the book itself and the construction thereof, and then we're going to move on to wine labels. This memoir seems absolutely fascinating. I'm probably going to set this aside or note it for a potential uh, blog post in future because I want to know more. Uh, but it's thick. This memoir is a total of 371 pages long. Um, <clears throat> so they are individual pages that were typed on a typewriter. Uh, I can tell by the... Uh, I, I, so originally typed on a typewriter, I think this may actually be a photocopy and not the original typed manuscript. Um, but they are typed on one side. Uh, and then, as I said, I believe this is probably a, a photocopy just based on, um, if you see an original typed item, there's, it, when you look sort of at an angle at the ink as it has been applied to the page. The combination of the ink and the actual typewriter key hitting the page leaves a little bit of a three-dimensional sort of indentation in the page. Um, and it's subtle. You, you wouldn't, you don't notice it when you're reading it. It's, it's not obvious, but it is there. And if you look at an angle, um, you can tell when it's an original typed document versus a photocopy. And I'm, 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 like 99% certain this is photocopy pages. Uh, they've had a three-hole punch applied to them, and then they are tied together with. Um, some string, which is uh, a fairly standard method, honestly, of, of uh, binding together a codex. Um, so the, the form that we call a book in modern times is, um, a, is actually, the, the, the form itself is a codex, uh, as opposed to like a scroll. So it is a method for organizing information that is bound pages um, that allows you to quickly go from like a table of contents or an index and jump straight to a certain part of it. Whereas if you had a guide similar to a table of contents or an index on a scroll, it's much harder to just jump straight to that spot. The codex was an advancement in technology that allowed for quickly jumping to specific sections of a written work. Um, 
<clears throat> anyway, so pretty standard. And then um, in binding, uh, in binding leaves together, there's typically a cover that goes over where the the string is, like the string or cord that ties the leaves together. Um, you can actually sort of see there's an there's a, a raised bit here. That's because the string goes out of the hole here, goes in the hole there. Uh, another string comes out of the hole here and goes in the hole there. Um, and so the spine of the book, the covering on the spine of the book, is partly there to cover that up so you don't see it and also so it doesn't wear over time. Any, anyway, um, I just, I wanted to share this. It's not the f focus of our uh, stream today. We're going to focus more on the wine labels. Um, but I just thought it was quite a nice piece. Um, and so I wanted to show it off because it is part of the collection. <clears throat> that said, I have the entire collection here of more than 5,500 wine labels. If there is a style of wine that you would like me to look for, let me know. I don't know. Let me look at uh, the Finding Aid and just see how it's organized. It is organized geographically. So if there is a country whose wine you would like me to spend some time looking at, uh, let me know and I will make sure that that makes it on stream. Um, any country, because I don't know for certain that there are any regions of the world that are not included. Uh, I imagine it's most likely going to be Central Europe uh, Australia and uh, Pacific Islands because those were the areas they traveled to but I as I said I don't know if that is the only time that they were collecting labels or not um, and just glancing at this box the <clears throat> see how I can show you uh, sort of sight on there. You can see the labels are in here and we've got like, um, we've got Brazil, we've got uh, Bulgaria, Canada, Chile, Cyprus, Czechoslo Czechoslovakia, Ecuador, Egypt, France, and within France, we have the different regions, Alsace, Bordeaux, Barzac, etc. So <clears throat> if there's a region you want to see, let me know. Um, if there's a specific type of wine within a region that you'd like to look at, let me know because that is apparently a possibility. I'm going to start, I think, because we're right here in the A's, I'm gonna start in Australia. <clears throat> Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, as well as France, Spain, Germany, Italy, Portugal, uh, would have been the major wine producers at the time. Maybe some from Greece, as well as Argentina and Chile from South America. Cool. Uh, what if... So I, I know very little about, about wine. I don't know what I'm gonna be pulling out here. <clears throat> the wines I know the most about are dessert wines. Um, what if I pull out uh, the section on Burgundy Red from Australia? And we'll see what we've got. Um, So these are like five by seven index cards. Oh. 
Now, these are like six by 10 index cards. <clears throat> anyway, uh, we get the label, uh, De Ehrenberg, Burgundy, produced by F.E. Osborne and Sons, um, PTY, I don't know what that abbreviation is, um, and then Limited. I don't know PTY. Uh, it's down there as an abbreviation right next to, to LTD for Limited. Um, if anybody knows what that abbreviation is for, uh, I'd be curious. Um, bottled by De Ehrenberg Wines. Um, I believe the back labels are here as well. Uh, McLaren Vale, South Australia. Net contents one pint, six. So this was a one pint bottle. Uh, apparently, gold medal award. Yeah, they've got a lovely coat of arms um, with this white flag with a red strike across it. Uh, and here we have the, the back label. PTY abbreviation for proprietary, used to denote a private limited company. Thank you, Thorkel. <clears throat> so yeah, the back label here, uh, and my monitor is super tiny, so I'm hoping that it is in focus and that you can see what it says there. I will bump it over to the left a little bit so that it is not behind my head. Um, we, we get a little map uh, De Ehrenberg, gold medal burgundy, made from a blend of grapes grown in the De Ehrenberg vineyard in the hills south of, uh, south of Adelaide, matured in new oak. This wine has developed into a magnificent, soft, full-bodied, rich burgundy. The wine is enhanced by a deposit of tartar due to age in bottle. Awarded a gold medal at Sydney Royal Easter Show, 1969, silver medal, Melbourne, 1968, and gold medal, open classes, any vintage, Melbourne, 1969. <clears throat> and let's see. The notes that uh, Campbell added here, label only from William... Uh, Hardy? Harity? I think it's Harity, but I'm not sure. Uh, 30 January 1970. Drunk, quote, drunk with pleasure. It's Hartley. Because uh, it's down there again. And I, I um, sorry, quote, drunk with pleasure at 16 uh, Gawler Crescent, Deacon ACT, Australia, on Thursday, January 22, 1970. Um, by Henry and Sylvia Richardson. Tom Campbell, no relation. Dorothy Jones, William and Alice Hartley. Uh, same lake from Henry Richardson. Oh, same label from Henry Richardson, 14 September 1970. So just noting um, where they got the label, uh, uh, the only commentary on the wine itself is drunk with pleasure. Uh, this is our first, our first look at the notational style uh, with regard to the wine labels and the wines themselves. Um, interesting. This, there are apps that let you do this sort of thing today. Um, I know there's one for beers and I know there's one for wines. I don't remember what they're called. I, I think they possibly did have friends send them labels in addition to going out and, and trying things themselves. Um, but uh, so there's definitely, I know there are apps that you can uh, note down wine or beer that you try it, note the place that you tried it, note your comments about it. Um, and they have social aspects and things like that. Um, I, I know when I go to archives conferences, <clears throat> I, in the past, when I physically went to archives conferences, I um, have used uh, the, the beer one, uh, which I don't remember the names of them right now. There are apps, they exist. 
uh, to note beers that I've had. Um, I've never really used the wine one, but as I said, I'm not really much of a wine drinker. So, uh, <laughs> Vivino is a good app, uh, but they try to sell you wine. Untapped, that's the one for the beer. Um, we need one for teas. I'm, I'd be surprised if there isn't one for teas. Uh, you're friends with both a certified sommelier and have the acquaintance of a certified uh, chicharrone? Is that how you say that? I'm not certain. And I'm not certain what, like I know what a sommelier is. I'm not. I now go and look things up because unfamiliar words. Old term for a guide who conducts visitors and sightseers to museums, galleries, etc., and explains matters of archaeological, antiquarian, historic, or artistic interest, presumably taken from Cicero. Uh, so, possibly more of a Cicerone. I like, I like Cicerone, though. Uh, <laughs> they, oh, oh, it's actually a term for a beer sommelier. Apparently, it's also an old term for a museum guide. Because uh, that's, I, I went and looked it up. Cicerone. Yeah, it is a kind of tour guide, apparently, Key Squared. All right, I, I'm going to look at the second wine label. Uh, I, have to, I have to stay on track uh, and actually show off the collection. Anyway, sorry, I'm drinking a lot because... <clears throat> my sinuses are irritated again, um, and it's warm in here, so. No, no, no. Uh, discussing with chat is part of what this program's about. We always learn something, and today we learned that the term for a guide to beers is a cicer cicerone, uh, and that that term is also an older term for a museum guide. Um, we have Emu Imperial Australian Burgundy by appointment to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Australian Wine Merchants, shipped and bottled by the Emu Wine Company Limited, London, E3, produced on the famous vineyards at Morfitt Vale, South Australia. This was a 26 fluid ounce bottle. The label was printed in Great Britain. We do not have a back label on this one. Um, <clears throat> uh, label only from Michael Kostrab from Australia, September 1972, International Congress of Entomology. <laughs> His entomology uh, friends, the people, the, the professional peers that he saw at entomology conferences apparently would give him wine labels. That is, that's interesting to me. But also just like, it's awesome. It's really awesome. This one is mounted uh, in the other direction here. Produce of Australia established 1837. Hamilton's Springton, Burgundy. Grown and bottled by Hamilton's Ewell Vineyards Limited. Glen Elg, South Australia. Net contents, 26 fluid ounces. Uh, Grand Pacific Hotel, Siwa, Fiji. Dinner, 9 May 1966. Least expensive of uh, on the wine list, seven over six for a half a bottle, but good. Initialed FLC. Uh, so Campbell apparently drank this one himself at uh, Grand Pacific Hotel in Fiji. 26 ounces is approximately 769 milliliters, very close to today's standard 750 milliliter bottle size. Cool. So they ordered the least expensive one on the list, but it was good anyway. <clears throat> Uh, selected Vintage, Private Bin, Burgundy, Bin 50, Vintage, 1963. Bin 50 is a soft, round, 
generous burgundy with an attractive flavor and palette. It is a product of Lindemann's Ben Ean Cellars, where it was matured in small oak casks and was made from red hermitage grapes grown at Lindemann's and other vineyards in the Hunter River, Clare and Barossa Valleys, and Kunawara. Bin 50 is an ideal accompaniment to all meat dishes and cheese. Lindemann's Wines. Uh, and there's that abbreviation. I've already forgotten what you said it meant. I'm going to look again. Proprietary Limited, uh, Sydney. One pint or six fluid ounces, produce of Australia. We do have a back label here. Private Bin, Australian Burgundy, Bin 50, vintage 1969. This wine was produced from red hermitage grapes grown in the Hunter River, Clare, and Eden Valleys, and at Langhorn Creek and Koroa. Bin 50 is a soft, round, generous burgundy with an attractive flavor and, and round, smooth palate. It is an ideal accompaniment to all meat dishes and cheese. It may be enjoyed now or safely binned away in your cellar for many years to come. Um, bottled by Lindemann's Wines, Proprietary Limited, Sydney, Australia, 12% by alcohol by volume. So, I don't know, and I'm curious now what Australians use the word bin for. <clears throat> this label, so this wine is bin 50, and uh, they mention uh, they, they mention that it can be binned away. And um, in the U.S., bin, we don't really use it for anything specifically. It, it can be like a storage container or something like that. Uh, in Britain, it's very specifically a trash can, as far as I'm aware. Uh, so, uh, like, reading this with my knowledge of, of how the language the English language differs geographically. I just have to wonder about a label that says that the wine can be say, uh, can be binned away um, uh, for our our British audience. They're gonna be like the the wine can be thrown away into the trash, <laughs> and uh you're thinking bin like storage bin um I'm, I'm guessing that that is what they mean in this context i it's just my brain was like they need some consultation if they want to break into a british market because this is not the way to describe it um the word generous is what got your attention clearly the burgundy is donating to charities uh, let's see, uh, Campbell's notes on this. I enjoyed this very much. Bought it in Sydney, New South Wales on 3 November 1965 and finished in Canberra on 5 November. Cost about a dollar. Um, the label here is actually from Frank uh, Braxley from 1973, which is why this, I wondered because on the front, this label is for 1963 vintage, and on the back, the back label is the 1969 vintage. Um, amazing cost, a dollar, yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, I'm gonna move on from Australian Burgundies, though, because there's a heck of a lot more here. Uh, I'm gonna start, like, randomly picking things. Um, how about... How about I pull some that I'm not going to be able to pronounce? That's always fun. <clears throat> Again, uh, we are still, or no, we, we are, uh, let's see, this is Austria now. So moving on from Australia, we are now in Austria. Uh, Leibner? I think is the brand, L-O-I-B-N-E-R, Leibner uh, Kaiservine, Kaiservine. You don't drink, but you have a favorite wine label. So we haven't really talked much about the designs. The Australian Burgundies from like the 60s didn't have particularly interesting designs. 
uh, they were pictures of like farms in silhouette and stuff like that. Um, so not, not particularly eye-catching uh, for the ones that we saw. But then again, what do you want a wine label to do? Convey sophistication or be attractive to the eye? Or both, or neither. <clears throat> yeah, this one has a lot of flags on it. Um, and it has a watermark in the back, uh, which is Dinstelgut Leuben. I'm uncertain exactly how to pronounce that. Dinstelgut, D uh, the combination of N-S-T-L-G without any vowels in there is a, a difficult one for me. Uh, this one is clearly designed to be eye-catching, uh, which you want for a retail wine. They had a lot of verbiage, you're right, describing the wine. <clears throat> so this is a Kaiser vine. Um, and I cannot... <laughs> Not only is the uh, text at the bottom in cursive, it's also in um, German. So... And it's very small font. Uh, I'm not going to be able to make that out, I don't think. Let's read the notes on this wine from Campbell. Note the endorsement of this wine by the Emperor Franz Joseph in fine print at the bottom of the label. So that's the German that I couldn't read. Uh, the present bottle showed on a... The present bottle showed on a neck piece that the wine was of the vintage of 1963 and was from the uh, Wachau. It was one of the more expensive white wines. Um, there's a notation of currency there and my brain stopped as soon as it saw it. 30 over 0.7. A cursive lowercase l, which in Austria, I don't know what the currency would be that has that notation. <clears throat> uh, I opened it on 8 February 1965 and found it good, of course. It was finished by uh, Joan Phelan, Vienna, Austria, FLC. Um, all right. Oh, oh, thank you, Thorkel. It, the, the l is not money. $30 for 0.7 liters. That would make sense. <clears throat> 0.7 liters is a normal wine bottle size. Thank you, Just Here for Coffee. Also, hi, Just Here for Coffee. I don't know if I said hello when you showed up. And and Shadows of Life, I, I don't think I saw you pop in. Or I, I saw that you were here, but I don't think I registered that you arrived. Um, a duck on it and was called a Oh, your favorite wine label it has a duck on it and was called Decoy. That, that is cute. So this one looks, uh, design-wise, very Austrian-German. Like, this is what I would expect from an Austrian or German wine. I, there's a design aesthetic that gets used for the Rhineland, uh, and, and this fits it. Dinstelgut, large historical winery near Leuben, Austria, dates back to a royal land grant to a local monastery in 860, which is why up here this flag with two crossed keys has 860. Uh, passed through various ownership, was inherited by a Dr. Ferdinand Dinstel in 1832, later a member of parliament. Amazing! More typically today, it's 0.75 liters, but back in the 60s, 70s, seems like they were a bit less standardized. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. Uh, Wein aus der Wachau, another Leubner. <laughs> Winzer Genossenschaft. 
I believe is the type of wine. Nope, I don't know. Leubner Kauchel. Gruner Weltliner. Let's see what we can glean from the thing. White wine from the Vine Keller. $22 for five liters. Good 12 to 15 December 1964, Vienna, Austria. Very simple. European wine labels are typically region or winery and may or may not include the grape. Gruner Veltliner is the grape. Gotcha. Winzer Genossenschaft? Is that the type of wine? <laughs> Rough translation of the text. Uh, there grows a fine wine in our land and Emperor Fran Frank Joseph uh, delighted when he got a cup from the mayor of Vienna. Nice, thank you, Fluid Anne. <laughs> oh, um, it's a group of wine producers, got it. I have no idea, like, I really, if it's not ice wine, I don't know much about it. Retzer Magister, I think this one says. Gruner Veltliner, original Altenburg. Weingut A. Mosmer, Retz N slash O. Um, there's a little like wax seal type thing that's also been preserved here on the card. Um, and that would have been something on the wine bottle. Um, another pleasant white wine, uh, 30S over 7.7 liters. 30 something, I don't know. Uh, 23 to 25 June, 1965, Vienna, Austria. So just noting uh, the, the money and like the cost and whatnot of them. Lots more Gruner Veltliner items here from this section because they're organized geographically. So we're getting a lot of similar ones next to each other. Schaft suffix usually indicates an organization or community of some kind. <coughs> oh, thank you for dropping the finding aid portico in there. If anybody else, I guess I could do over here too. <sighs> Amazingly, there are two, and only two, cards in here from Canada. 1960s, Canadian wine. Schilling, Austrian currency. Thank you, Fluid End. <clears throat> Canadian wine was not really a thing in the 60s, as far as I'm aware. We have Chateau Gay, uh, Canadian Burgundy. Says Canada's wines of distinction down here in this little like fanciful thing. It's hard to see. Uh, produced by Chateau Gay Wines Limited, Niagara Falls, Canada. Serve at room temperature. Uh, this is a, 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 a red wine, so that makes sense. Canada's a bit cold for most wine grapes, but let me tell you, ice wine. Uh, I, ice wine is very sweet. It is a dessert wine and quite expensive. It is the wine that is produced uh, by letting the grapes stay on the vines until they freeze. Uh, Canada is a large producer of ice wine. I quite like ice, ice wine. Uh, this, my only Canadian wine, I bought in Toronto on 23 May 1967 with the help of Barbara Minor Parker, price $1.51. It was excellent. More like real Burgundy than any other North American wine I have bought under that name. F.L. Campbell. 
Room temperature in Europe is usually colder than in the US. Red wine's typically served around 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Interesting, I would not have known that there was a specific temperature meant by room temperature in the context of wine, but it makes perfect sense that that would be the case. Um, this one was filed in here under Canada, and it is Can Canadian. I just, his other card said my only Canadian wine, so let's find out about this. This one is a very small label. <clears throat> London, red dinner wine. Net contents, one pint. Uh, 1965, London Winery Limited. Why are you going to sleep again? I don't understand. Like, you were specifically told not to go to sleep. Why are you going to sleep? Anyway. Um... Alcoholic volume, 13%. Uh, copyright registered in Canada. London Winery Limited. They have a nice little... This is a very, like, cabaret graphic. I'll, I'll pull it a little closer to the camera here. Um, just very, like, colorful. Reminds me of, like, 1960s Broadway. Uh, and the little grape graphic in the center there. Uh, <clears throat> Produced and bottled in Canada by London Winery Limited, London, Ontario, Canada. This represents an interesting surprise that was sprung on me by the Jean Harrisons at their apartment in Virginia Beach on 11 April 1973. The bottle was molded to resemble an ordinary wine bottle. Uh, resting in a wicker cradle, which is sometimes used to facilitate uh, decanting of a wine from which a sediment has precipitated. This wine, however, had no sediment. It was just a Swedish red wine, noteworthy only for having pro been produced in Canada, London, Ontario. <clears throat> All right, let's see what other locations or wines. And again, if you have a particular favorite style of wine uh, and want me to see if there are any cards in here for it, let me know if you have a particular country that you'd be interested to see if anything exists here from. Uh, let me know, I'm happy to take, take on that part of the adventure with you. Uh, since we have limited time and won't be looking at every single item in the collection, uh, requests are happily welcomed. Interesting there wasn't a vintage. What you want to know is how they remove the labels from the bottles without damaging them. Yeah, these are all in really good condition. I don't know. <clears throat> you didn't know ice wine was a thing. I doubt there's any ice wine anywhere in this collection. I don't know kind of when it became a thing. Um, but yeah, it is, it is expensive, so I don't really drink it much. Uh, it's like a special occasion wine. Uh, for me, like a table wine, something that I would want to just have occasionally with dinner, uh, would be something like a Moscato de Asti, which to most people is, is a dessert wine, but that is a wine that I could have basically any any time and with any meal. Like, for me, that is a drinking wine. Uh, and, and so <clears throat> most of the stuff we're looking at today would not be wines I would enjoy because I have a very uh, sweet, wet preference when it comes to wine. Um, old wine labels used water-soluble adhesive, so you just had to wet it. Interesting. Thank you, Philip. <clears throat> Um, so here we have a wine label, uh, Samarillion, Chilean Riesling, White Chilean Table Wine, Gran Vino, product of Chile, uh, 
Alcohol 12% by volume. This was a one pint bottle. Um, Vina Caspa de Piedra. Lantue Chile. Uh, Embortadelo y Distributo por Licores Mitians S.A. That's the produced and bottled. I mean, that's in Bortadella. I mean, this is something like exported and distributed for Lisores Mitians. I, I'm not certain. Uh, it's my best guess at translation without typing it into a translator. Um, produced and bottled in Chile, imported by Nova Import Inc., Washington, D.C. So this is a Chilean wine for export. <clears throat> and it does not have any notes. It's just a label. There's no information. I don't know what date it's from. I don't know what he thought of it. Um, we have struck out. <clears throat> Here we have a Gran Vino uh, Canepa Riesling, vintage 1936, bottled by uh, Establecimientos, uh, Establecimientos uh, Vinicolas Canepa, Valparaiso, Chile, light Chilean wine. Um, and this is, again, all we know about it. A 1936 Chilean wine, yeah. It's a nice looking label. I like the design on it. Um, it it's Chile. It, this has a very, like artistically, it has a very South American look to it. Insofar as uh, there are certain artistic styles that certain industries use to represent different parts of the world. And this graphical design um, in the language of visual arts calls to mind um, Mexico, Western movies, uh, things like that. So Chile, probably not what would spring to mind first with this graphical design for an American audience, but um, definitely like Central America and so pulling further south to South America sort of makes sense. Um, Riesling's originally from Germany and that's probably, yeah, why they use the Gothic typeface for the Gran Vino and yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking like the brown around the edge, the yellow center, um, even uh, the the font for Canepa here, um, all of those feel very like Western, bringing to mind like yeah that in the American conception of like uh, Mexico Southwest region, and this being even further south into South America um, might have had it catch the attention of American audiences. I don't know. Uh, it's just my, my thoughts on um, what I've observed with graphical design. I would probably have to do a lot more research if I really wanted to be able to speak authoritatively about that. That is just you know my experience and, and what I think of it in seeing it for the first time ever. Um, Canchecoro. Uh, Here's a Gran Vino Cabernet, another wine of Chile for ex exportation. Red Chilean wine, vintage 1970. Uh, they've got a bull um, on a shield with a crown on top. Uh, and again, again, something that the American audience associates with um, Spanish culture, uh, like the, the bullfighting and things like that, um, showing up here on a Chilean label. 
purchased by FLC uh, Central Liquor Store, 23 April 1974, $1.99. In contrast to the related Pinot Noir, this wine did not have a pleasant taste. It was a relatively new wine that had not mellowed. Cabernet being the grape. Unclear if it's a Cabernet Franc or Cab Cabernet Sauvignon. Yeah, it doesn't say, it just says Cabernet. Apparently it was a young wine. Um, and we, we do have the referenced Pinot. Same brand. Interesting, the shield is different. So the Cabernet, the, or the Cabernet has the bull, and the Pinot Noir has this um, two field. Uh, that would be an interesting field of study, um, uh, heraldry on wine bottles. Um, estate bottled, red Chilean wine. Purchased by FLC, Central Liquor Store, <clears throat> $1.77. This was a bottle that probably was not saleable because it did not have a foil cover over the stopper. I bought it anyway because I suspected that something good was being overlooked. I was right. This wine must be among the best wines I have ever tasted. The flavor was so marked that prolonged... The flavor was so marked that prolonged tasting was unnecessary. Its goodness came through with the first sip. Yeah, we have a, we actually have a, a fairly decent collection on heraldry because um, it used to be one of our collecting areas here. Um, and so we have a lot of reference works in our rare books library about heraldry specifically. Um, And I would not have thought in, like, if I was doing reference work or something on heraldry, I never would have thought, hey, you know, examples of heraldry, check out that wine label collection. I never would have gone there mentally, but now I might just, you know, remember in the future, hey, wine labels sometimes have heraldry on them if you want, <laughs> if, if you're looking for examples of heraldry. <clears throat> uh, vintages on the Concha y Toro. Um, I don't know. Let me let me look and see. Da, 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 da. <clears throat> I mean, I don't. This is 1970 for the Cabernet. Uh, they're both 1970. They say estate bottled on, on both of them, and so I'm wondering if these, if the heraldry uh, is the heraldry for the estate where the vines are grown. That would be my guess, but I don't know for sure. So it might be related to a family, um, and that might be why it is uh, different on the different bottles. I don't know enough about um, Chilean history to know uh, specifically about grand estates and whether the families that owned them would have had heraldry, presumably yes. I just, I don't know enough about Chilean history to, to answer that off the top of my head. <clears throat> uh, the next ones I was going to look at here the, is from the next country in line, which is Cyprus. Um, <laughs> there are a few of them here. Um, Aphrodite. Medium dry Cypress wine, produced and bottled in Limassol, Cyprus by KEO Limited. Very Greek in design. Uh, we 
one of the wines from the Cosmos Club near East Wine Tasting, er, from the Cosmos Club near East Wine Tasting, uh, 17 January 1973, vintage 1967. NG, in quotation marks, is the only comment. I don't know. Does that mean not good? Unclear. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I don't know, know Thorkel. That's where my brain went, but just don't know. Othello, full-bodied red cypress wine, produced and bottled in Limassol Cyprus by KEO Limited. Uh, another one from the Cosmos Club. Aroma Poor Taste Fair. Again, 1967 vintage. We have a uh, Cyprus KEO Muscat. Uh, Povarenicuo. Nope. Yeah, I was going to try. Nope. Nope. Can't do it. Uh, the only word I can make out and, and actually pronounce is Bratislava. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's the information about product of such and such place manufactured here. Um, label only from Michael Kostarab, Christmas 1962. So we don't know anything about that wine specifically because it was just a label given by one of his entomologist friends. <laughs> um, we have another Cyprian Muscat Messvine. Again, uh, coat of arms. Very gold, this one. Anton uh, Septen Mans um, Rhein. So, interestingly, the first Cypriot wines that we saw, the labels were very Greek. And this one is more in line with some of the uh, Australian l designs that we saw um, and is full of German words. <laughs> Church wine. Mess wine is altar wine. Ah. Label only from Cleo Alderson, 10 April 1970. Uh, Bella Pais. Le Grand Vin Petillant Blanc. Produced and bottled by KEO Limited, Linusol Cyp Cyprus. Uh, <coughs> let's see. Uh, consumed at Cosmos Club near East Wine Tasting with George Weldy, 17 January 1973. Because this wine was carbonated, it tasted better than the other white wines of the evening. Very Arabic design. Yeah, uh, as far as the font goes, I would agree. It calls calls to mind some of the like um, the Turkish Empire or something like that. Uh, and then uh, the last one we have from Cyprus is Commandier uh, Commanderi Saint Jean. Cyprus dessert wine. This wine is as originally made during the Crusades by Knights Hospitaller of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem from the vines of the Commandery of Colossi Castle, Cyprus, produced and bottled by KEO Limited Limassol Cyprus, um, label only from Norm Phillips Pennington, New Jersey, consumed on their trip to Cyprus, April 1973. Okay, computer, you and I need to have a talk. Stop 
putting the display to sleep. Why are, like, turn display off? Never. 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 Some, for some reason, the computer felt that it had the authority to reset itself to the defaults, despite the fact that I told it to turn the display off. Never. Anyway. Uh, yeah, very, very Templar helmet um, on this label. Uh, and it's claiming that this is made exactly the way that it was by the Knights Hospitaller of of um, the Order of St. John of Jerusalem during the Crusades. So uh, that would make sense stylistically. <clears throat> Let's see. This is just the first box, y'all. Uh, we are... Let's see. I'm going to skip on past some France here. I'm going to look... I'm curious to see if the, if their Knights Hospitaller was one of the Orders of the Templars, the only one that survived the purges. Um, I want to see what there is from the U.S. And particularly, I'm very curious to see whether there happen to be any Virginia wines because Virginia winemaking didn't really take off for quite some time. So I'm gonna look for that first, uh, and then, you know, possibly pull out some other stuff and, and take a gander. Uh, but just because Virginia Tech is here in Virginia, uh, and I'm curious, I wanna look and see, let's see, Switzerland, Tunis, Turkey, Uruguay, USA. <clears throat> the USA section. We have Arkansas, California, and within California. Also, Arkansas? There is a section divider for Arkansas, but no wine label. I don't know. Ohio. Uh, I will look. Um, I'm just going to throw a label up here so that you all have something to look at other than just the table. Um, within the US, the first large segment is California, unsurprisingly. But within California, there are subdivisions for Barbara, Burgundy, Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chablis, Charbon, Chenin Blanc, uh, Chianti, Claret, Concord Grape, French Colombard, Gamay, Gewurztraminer, uh, Green Hungarian, Grignolio, Grig Grignolino, uh, Malvasio Bianca, May Wine, Mendocino Red, Mendocino White, Moscato, Navelle White, Paisano, Petit Syrah, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Noir, Red Pinot, Rhine, Riesling, Rosé, uh, Satur Sat Saturna, Saturna Dry, Saturna Sweet, Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, Sparkling, Treminer and Zinfandel. Some are regions and some of them are grapes, yes. Uh, but those are the subdivisions within the California section of the um, USA section of the wine labels. Um, oh, and then that's not all. Apparently also within California with miscellaneous red, rosé, white, and then we finally move on to 
So let's see, Indiana, Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, New York. Sparkling is an interesting one. Uh, I will make a note in my brain to go back and pull that in a second. Um, in New York, we have subdivisions for Burgundy, Catawba, Catawba Pink, Chablis. Um, then let's see, we have Delaware, and within Delaware, we have Rhine, Rosé, Sauterne, Sauterne Dry, and Sparkling and Varietal within Delaware. Uh, in North Carolina, uh, has a section. There's a section for Pennsylvania. There's a section for Texas. There is a section for Virginia, which uh, we will definitely be looking at in a second. Uh, Washington, miscellaneous within Washington. Uh, there is a section for the USSR. Um, Actually, a, quite quite a large section for the USSR. Rainwater? And then uh, we end out with Yugoslavia. I did not see Ohio anywhere, sadly. Um, honestly, I don't know Thorkel, whether whether that is the case for like Virginia wine production is low enough that it's almost exclusively consumed locally today. I do know that there, oh, Barbara is actually Bar, Bar, Barbara, got it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's weird. The only place I saw a subdivision for rainwater was within the USSR section. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, I know that there are Virginia wineries and that Virginia wineries have grown. There are many more of them today than there used to be. Um, uh, the climate has changed. It's gotten warmer. It's gotten better for grapes in Virginia uh, because the world is warming. And so further and further north, there's good grape growing. Um, and there are older grapes in Virginia now because people who started growing uh, decades ago have more mature vines and uh, Virginia doesn't get the types of wildfires that California does, which has actually led to um, uh, some of the more recent wine There were uh, stories just a couple weeks ago about um, wines being basically undrinkable because they taste like fire. They taste like smoke. And, and they're basically not drinkable because of all the wildfires. Um, and so I know there are some more well-established and mature uh, uh, vineyards in Virginia now. Um, uh, but I don't know about uh, incidents of exportation to other places or whether it is primarily just consumed here. I, I just thought that, you know, I it would be interesting to look since we are located at Virginia Tech uh, in Virginia that it would be a curious thing. Um, so what we have here is something that I threw up just to, sh to, to fill the screen while I was f uh, flipping through to see what else we've got. Uh, but we'll take a look at it anyway. Um, it is a California Barbera wine, uh, Kenwood, made and bottled by Kenwood Vineyards, Kenwood, California, established in 1906, alcohol 12% vol uh, by volume, 12% volume. <clears throat> Very simple. It is a line, line art drawing of the vineyard, presumably, um, with the rows of the grapes, uh, the mountains in the district distance. This is a very like classic, uh, sophisticated California wine label design. Um, it's got just the little hint of the green with the grape leaves sort of lining the sides. That's a that is a um, like a 1920s 
sort of callback design element. Like that is something I would expect to see in the uh, sort of graphic design that happened just before the Art Deco stuff that got really geometric. Um, the quality of the color of green combined with just the fact that it's grape leaves sort of harkens back to that time period. I don't know if, uh, so this is established in 1906. Uh, so this winery would presumably have been in operation when that was a dominant design thing. And so maybe that's a callback to some of their origins. I don't know. Um, gift from, uh, Somebody Stewart. I cannot make out the first name. Eileen Stewart. 5 February 1977. In California, Barbera seems to be regarded as a ver uh, varietal wine. I don't know what that means. What is a varietal wine? Uh, my guess is that this was expensive because... Um, Eileen wanted to be sure I did not have the label. <laughs> she bought it at the winery, which is a small one. Um, we drank part of the bottle while Eileen was having dinner with us tonight. We both thought that it had a good flavor and no bite, probably better than an Italian Barbera would be. It happened that Eileen lives at Kenwood House in Kenwood, Maryland. FLC. <clears throat> so yeah, I don't know, I, I don't know what's meant by a varietal wine. Barbera is a Italian grape variety, right, I just, the way he used it here saying varietal and then there's a section in the in a couple of these that the section title is varietal. I, I'm not certain um, exactly what that means. Uh, we can definitely look at more California stuff if people are interested. Um, but first, Virginia, because that was what I, I went skipping through to find. Um, and it's a small section, and I'm curious. Uh, as far as you know, varietal just references the grape type. Gotcha. Uh, we may poke into one of the sections labeled varietal just to see what, what's included in that section. And that may, might help us understand. Um, all right. These are the Virginia ones. Old Homestead, American Scuppermong, or Scupper... Scuppernong wine, that's N-O-N-G. Alcohol 20% by volume, bottled by Southland Wine Company, Petersburg, Virginia. This design feels very American, but also feels I look at this and it's weird that it's grapes. Uh, just the the old homestead logo here with the red sort of graphic here, I feel like it's screaming apples, which is a very Virginia thing. Like apples and, and cideries and whatnot is huge in Virginia. I see this graphic and it screams apples to me. Uh, possibly because I grew up in Virginia and I'm used to seeing this sort of graphic design with apple related things. The grapes feel weird because my brain says this should be apples. Uh, apparently Scuppernong is a grape from the southern US. I knew it was a word I had seen before but also did not know what it meant so thank you for that. Uh, label only from Michael Kutstarb, 8 January 1975, so we don't know very much about the uh, Scuppernong here. <clears throat> uh, here again, we have one that says estate and it has a coat of arms. I'm beginning to think that that might be a thing. Um, 
20% is a pretty f high alcohol by volume indeed. Um, estate bottled, vintage 1975, Meredith, Virginia, uh, Matercall Foch, grown, produced, and bottled by Meredith Vineyards, Middleburg, Virginia, alcohol 12% by volume. So Petersburg, which was the previous one, Petersburg is South Virginia? Uh, I say with a question in my voice. I, and I run to a, an internet-based map to discover exactly where it is located. Yes, just south of Richmond is Petersburg. However, this one is from Middleburg, which is north. Just double checking. <clears throat> yeah, so Middleburg is up, uh, Middleburg uh, is up sort of near Leesburg. Um, and because the Washington DC metropolitan area is enormous now, uh, Middleburg sort of is considered part of the DC Metro and it would be very conceivable that people would be commuting from Middleburg to Washington DC considering there are quite a few people who commute all the way from West Virginia. But um, Marichal Foch is another grape you've never heard of but it was developed in France in the early 20th century. Uh, and it looks like, thank you Hannah, it looks like this vineyard closed over 30 years ago. Uh, again, label only, this label from 1979. I do like this, even if he has no information about the wine itself, we know that this label is from 1979. We don't know what vintage, or this is a, a 75 vintage, um, so bottled in 75, uh, the label was removed from the bottle and put on this index card in 1979. Dating things, really good for historical research. Um, oh boy. Uh, Bull Run brand. Red Grape Wine. Alcohol 12% to 14% by volume. Blended with fine California wines. Bottled by John Scuto. Bonded Winery Number 19, Manassas, Virginia. The bottle, oh God, oh God, it's got a pun at the bottom. The bottle of Bull Run. Uh, for anyone who is not familiar, um, Manassas, Virginia was the site of numerous uh, battles during the American Civil War. Um, Manassas, I believe, oh, now you're going to test my Virginia history. Uh, we have a, um, we have a Civil War collection here, so I don't want to say it and be wrong. Got it. Thank you for confirmation, internet. Um, Manassas, Virginia is a location in Northern Virginia uh, <clears throat> in Prince William County, uh, which is like two counties south of Washington, DC. And it was the site of multiple battles during the American Civil War. Uh, the battle uh, the, the first battle of Bull Run and the second battle of Bull Run being the two major conflicts, um, also known as the uh, Battle of First Manassas and the Battle of Second Manassas. Uh, and the difference in the naming is Bull Run was the name given by the Union forces to those battles and Manassas was the name given by the Confederate forces to those battles. Um, so yeah, Bull Run brand red, red grape wine. Um, this label screams cheap. The design elements are there. 
Uh, it's got the beiges. It's got the gold sort of vaguely Art Deco-ish. It features the grapes. Why the wine is in a martini glass, I don't know. That seems odd to me. Um, but red grape wine is not a style. And it says it is blended with fine California wine, which seems to put caution in me with regard to the quality of this wine. And then it ends with a pun. The bottle of Bull Run. Which anyone local would get the joke, because it's the battle of Bull Run. The bottle of Bull, Bull Run. Um, so having, I don't know, I don't actually know if the pun was on the label to begin with. Um, what I can see of the pun, it was written with a felt tip pen of some sort. Uh, so like permanent marker, felt tip pen. I cannot tell though whether the felt tip on there is overwriting text that was already there or was just added. I'm unable to tell. I would need to see other examples of this winery's labels to know for sure whether this pun was part of their marketing. There are no notes. There are no notes on the back. Martini glass blended with California wines. Probably one to steer clear of. Uh, let's see, we've got double barrel. These are so garish compared to the European wines and the Australian wines and the Chilean wines and the, the California wine that we saw. Like uh, all of the other wine labels that we've seen were stylized but classy. Even the Canadian one that was sort of evoking a 1960s Broadway cabaret aesthetic was classy compared to these scream um, American farm country, which is typically not what wineries try to convey. This, this is screaming sort of that like um, country aesthetic that city people decorate their homes the way they think that somebody living on a farm would decorate. It's that kind of aesthetic. Uh, and, and that's what these scream to me. This is, this is like, um, if anybody, and I'm sorry for people who are not in the US, uh, if anybody's ever been to a Cracker Barrel to eat, it's that kind of aesthetic. Um, so we have Double Barrel brand. This is a pure grape wine, red grape wine. Again, not really a style. Red grape wine. Uh, alcohol 14% by, by volume produced and bottled by Richard's Wine Cellars Incorporated, Petersburg, Virginia. I, it, I'm not saying this is Cracker Barrel wine, but it is that design aesthetic of... The design aesthetic, the sort of audience that Cracker Barrel tries to reach is the audience for this wine label. Uh, and compare that with our next Virginia wine label. Oh, wait, there are notes. Purchased by Ina at uh, Radford Brothers Grocery Store in Blacksburg, Virginia, 27 July 1971 for 99 cents. Uh, Frank says, manufactured. 
in Petersburg, Virginia with manufactured underlined. They didn't produce this wine, according to Frank. They manufactured this wine, according to, to Frank. The label does say produced, uh, but his comment on it was manufactured. <laughs> Probably labeled as red grape wine because it's a blend that doesn't qualify it for a particular known grape or blend style. Probably Thorkel. Um, compare that to this wine label, also from a Virginia winery. This is the last Virginia one that we have. Um, Four-fifths of a quart, schiotto, uh, chill before opening, made in Virginia. Um, I do think now, just glancing at it, I think that the bottle of Bull Run was added and that that was the commentary that would normally have been on the back of the card. I don't think that's part of their marketing. I think that that is added because here we also have a comment added. Um, alcohol 12% to 14% by volume. Norton, Gred, er, Norton Red Grape Wine. No idea. Natural juice fermentation of the grape. Made and bottled by John Ciuto Bonded Winery. Uh, Manassas, Virginia. And the comment written on here is crackling, excellent chilled. Uh, that is the only note. But the design here, very similar to one of the first Austrian labels that we saw. Um, this label uh, situates this, even though it's a Norton Red, which Norton, not a grape variety that most people are going to have any associations with. The design here says we are a real winery and this is a decent product. That is, that's the design they were going for. Whether whether it is a decent product or not, I can only take um, uh, Frank Campbell's commentary here saying, crackling, excellent chill, uh, to say that it was worth drinking. Let's see. Um, what was the, there was a request earlier. I did not find any Ohio ones, but there was something else. Somebody asked for one, and I can't find where that was, so I apologize. If there was something you wanted to see, do let me know. We are running low on time, uh, so won't have too many more that we can look at. Um, I think the next one for now that I'm going to pull out is... I'm going to... Possibly, I'm gonna jump to California here real, real quick. Uh, Australian port style, particularly from the Barossa Valley region. I would be happy to look. I was gonna, I was gonna go and take a look at some of the dessert wines because, as I said, those are more my jam. But I'm happy to pump, bump back over to Australia and see what we've got. Um, so I don't have anything specifically labeled Barossa. Port is a dessert wine, you are, you are correct. Um, I don't see anything labeled for that region or as port. Let me see, I've seen stuff labeled dessert wine other places. Burgundy red, Burgundy white, Cabernet, Chablis, Claret, Hermitage, Hawk, Moselle, Porphyry, Riesling, Rosé, Shiraz, Sparkling, and Miscellaneous. Those are the categories in Australia. 
<clears throat> I tried. Thank you for asking. I would have been very interested to see what was there as well. Uh, let's see. I was, I was going to look and see if there were some California dessert wines in here. Zinfandel, trim. So there was sparkling. I don't think there. So in USSR, there is specifically a dessert category, and I'm not opposed to looking there. It is a country that no longer exists, uh, has not existed since the 1980s. Dessert wine. Uh, but at the time this collection is from, it existed. And we'll see, if there are any Cyrillic characters, I may need assistance. Uh, so far, not seeing any. Vino Aoniatico, dessert wine, produced by Society Vini Bertocini, Leghorn, Italy. Leghorn? Italy. Why is this in the USSR ones when it's Italy? Is, wait, am I just misunderstanding the categories? Or maybe this is, maybe this is just a category, category called dessert wine and not a subset of USSR. I think that's what it is. Uh, purchased by Frank at Macy's, uh, New York, 7 March 1957, 16%. Um, special Fiasco? Shape of Chianti Fiasco, but flat on bottom and without straw. Frisco. Frisco? I'm uncertain whether this is Frisco or Fiasco. I, I think it is some sort of, like they're talking about the bottle, but I'm not clear on what word that is. <laughs> port is a fortified wine, that is indeed true. And port is not one of the dessert wine varieties that I particularly like. Um, and in some cases, dessert wine is cloyingly sweet. I would say ice wine and port and things like that definitely are. Um, I was saying earlier, my, my go-to wine, my everyday wine, my I can drink it with anything wine is Moscato de Asti, which is considered a dessert wine, but to me is, is just perfect for whenever. Um, I, that is my go-to, which is very sweet, very wet, uh, most people consider it a dessert wine, um, so most of these wines are not ones that I would enjoy. Um. <laughs> but I've had a, an occasional port. I think I've got like a 30-year-old port in my closet at home. Uh, imported by Treasury Import Company, New York City, $1.94 one pint, or per one pint. Good dessert wine. <laughs> that's, that's the comment. Good dessert wine. This is a really cool collection. Bertaccini Vino Aliatico. New label, never on bottle, from Inger Hermann's father, Copenhagen, uh, December 1960. We have a number of these Bertaccini labels that are like that. fortified because they stop the fermentation to preserve the sugar, then inject natural grape spirits to up the alcohol by volume. So, um, yeah, yeah, and then, which is different than how they end up with um, alcoholic sweet wines for, uh, for ice wine. Um, I prefer the ice wine to the port insofar as a sweet wine that, um, I don't know, there's a different quality to the flavor. 
Uh, vino Lacrima Christi, white wine, Bertocini Livorno, product of Italy, contents four fifths of a quart, alcohol 14% by volume. The Tears of Christ, white wine. Oh, there's a, there's a novel written here. Uh, I found this in an odds and ends basket at the Circle Liquor Store at 5500 Connecticut Avenue Northwest near Chevy Chase Circle, Washington, DC. The store was eager to get rid of it for 99 cents. Uh, the date was 17 October 1968, our 250th, or 258th anniversary. I, it really does say our 258th anniversary. Uh, I already had three dessert wines from this producer, which um, contained 16% alcohol. Therefore, I suspect that the present wine, though 14%, is also fortified. Uh, the bottles were by Bertaccini. Uh, the bottles used by Bertaccini are of unconventional design. The present bottle being the queerest. It is of green glass molded and shaped so as to suggest the flapping wings and extended curved neck of a crowing rooster. And the cap is a plastic orange colored head of a crowing rooster. The bottom, uh, I'm not certain what this sentence, the bottom fourth of the bottle, thank you. <clears throat> is sapphire colored no raffia covered the bottom fourth of the it was like sapphire didn't make sense there but uh the bottom fourth of the bottle is raffia covered um woven at the base the importer was John Lawrence Company Limited of West Orange, New Jersey. I wonder whether there is a connection between Leghorn and the rooster. Uh, that being a reference to Warner Brothers cartoons, if uh, anybody um, was not familiar, there was an animated character in Warner Brothers cartoons called Foghorn Leghorn, uh, and he was a rooster, a, a large rooster who walked and talked like in a more like human anthropomorphic sort of um, figure. Uh, this was a sweet wine somewhat over the hill. It helped a lot to mix it half and half with ginger ale. <laughs> um, I don't know that I've ever heard of anybody mixing wine with ginger ale, but Very interesting. Vino Lacrima Christi. The Tears of Christ wine by uh, Bertocini Livorno that was in a bottle made of green glass shaped to look like a crowing rooster with its wings out uh, and raffia covered at the base with it woven at the very bottom. That is certainly different marketing. Leghorn is an Italian breed of chicken from the Livorno region, which is known as Leghorn in English for some reason. Just here for coffee, that is very interesting information and likely is in some way related to why Foghorn Leghorn was named that in the Warner Brothers cartoons more so than uh, the wine interesting cool that is cool 
Foghorn Leghorn is probably supposed to be that breed. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we ended on a really interesting one because uh, we are at the end of stream. Uh, I have to tear down stuff and get ready to go home for the day. Um, this was a really neat collection. I, I did not know we had this, and I found this quite interesting, even not knowing much about wines. I, I just, this is a really cool collection uh, that I did not know existed, and now feel that I must probably make a blog post about next time it's time for me to do a blog post. We'll see. Uh, it's definitely go gonna go on my list of, we should maybe point at this and let people know that it's here because it's really interesting. Um, anyway, thank you all for joining me for this, uh, this episode of Archival Adventures. Thank you so much to um, Eric for the raid earlier. Um, and so, Thorkel, I don't know. I mean, I, there's always a chance, uh, but digitization hours are um, expensive. And so this is definitely not a priority collection to be digitized. If there were sections that somebody was interested in, we could probably scan them and get them that if they needed them for reference purposes. But the whole collection, um, it's big. And even though they're all on these index cards, um, having them like run through a machine with the uncertainty as to uh, how solidly the labels are affixed to the cards and things like that um, would be questionable. So I, it would probably be a, a somewhat more manual process than just like loading them into a feeder and scanning them that way. Um, so the likelihood is probably not, at least not anytime soon. Uh, but it's a good question. Uh, we would need to have, um, it would need more attention. If, if lots of people were interested in it and it was regularly getting used for uh, people's research or reference, then that would be something where we would look at putting the money into staffing the time to digitize it and put it online. Um, I am guessing this is probably one of the first times this collection has ever been used. So uh, not likely to get scanned unless it gets significantly more use. But you know, now that people know it exists, maybe, maybe it will. Um, anyway, I, I had a lot of fun looking at this today. Uh, when I picked this collection, I did not know that today was National Wine Day. Um, and so it was just entirely serendipitous uh, to share this collection on National Wine Day. I, I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, next week, we are set for the Michael Two Horses collection. Um, it is a collection from uh, a former visiting professor here at Virginia Tech. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be poking through that. Um, and then in a couple of weeks, I'm actually going to be skipping two weeks. <laughs> I'm taking some vacation at the end of June, so there are a few more streams before then, but um, that is coming up on the horizon. Uh, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and set up for the raid. Um, and I'm hoping, I'm, I'm assuming that the aquarium is on. Um, and they are. The Monterey Bay Aquarium is on. It does look like jellyfish cam today. Uh, so we are going to pop on over there. Um, again, thank you everybody so much for joining me today. I hope that I see you again soon. And until I do, have an adventure exploring history. Um, I should probably prepare to like end the stream. Anyway, um, I hope that you all have, have an adventure. Uh, in your future. Um, thank you all for joining me.